Welcome to Imperfect Momming. Our children are constantly looking to us for examples. The term role model doesn't quite cut it here. We are shaping their worldview with every move we make. You see, it's not in the lectures we give or moments where we are actively attempting to teach them. It's in the micro movements we make, the unconscious ways in which we navigate life. We are constantly teaching our children how to show up for themselves, their friends, their future partners, and even their future children. So what can we do to ensure we are raising thoughtful, compassionate, self-aware human beings? We have to become them ourselves. No one is perfect, but we can still all be better, and it starts with self-healing. Let's get to it. Welcome back to Imperfect Mommy, and we have a very special guest today, Victoria Yates. Welcome to Imperfect Mommy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. So my name is Victoria Yates. I am an intuitive eating and body image coach for women. So I help women have a better relationship with food and their bodies and really get away from dieting. But while they're doing that, create the healthy life that they're really looking for. So a little bit of backstory, I guess. I actually was a nurse for five years before getting into this area of work. So, um, and then I'm a mom also. So I have two little ones. I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. So very much in the the freshness of being a mom. Yeah, you got your hands full. (laughs) (laughs) I, I remember I remember hearing somebody I think it was Jim Gaffigan he's a comedian uh talking about that phrase you've got your hands full yes. he's like that's not helpful <laughs> what I remember from Jim Gaffigan I am a big Jim Gaffigan fan but I remember he was doing some bit and he was talking someone he said someone asked him what it was like having five kids or something like that and they were like imagine you're drowning and someone hands you a baby <laughs> And then four more. <laughs> yes. I don't know if he said that, but I'm adding that because yeah, one feels like that, but you know, it can get so yeah. much harder. <laughs> but honestly, it's so my daughter, we, we didn't plan that. Like we didn't go out and say, we want to have our kids 14 months apart, but it, you know, it happens and it has been the biggest blessing. It was, it's, so fun now with their ages, just seeing, you know, how they interact with each other. And it's, it's fun. It's hard, but it's good. So. Well, and, and the beautiful thing is that you don't know any other way. Exactly. So so you, you, you don't know what it would be like to have one five years apart, you know, or have two five years apart. Right. So I, one of the, uh, one of my guests had twins and, you know, I told her that that twins would be my nightmare. (laughs) And she goes, I don't have any other experience. And it's like, well, that's, you know, that makes it easy. And at the point when I had my son, my thought was let's have another one, like lickety split. Cause then they're both in diapers at the same time. And then they pretty much get out at about the same time. So then you're done. (laughs) I'm done yeah. with diapers, you know. <laughs> it's nice in that fact that we already had the baby stuff out. We already kind of were not sleeping. <laughs> so, you know, we we're just in it still. So now it's kind of like, I feel like I'm at the point where I'm like, life is getting too easy. Something feels wrong. Should we have another? <laughs> I'm I was like, like oh. don't ever think life is too easy because then life's what? like, here, let me what throw you a curveball. What am I thinking? I right. don't know. <laughs> I actually made a comment about the weather here. Uh, I'm in central California and uh, it's basically a desert. And so we have record highs all, you know, every year. And we'll have, I think one year we had like 90 days of straight three digits. And this year we've barely hit three digits, maybe half a dozen times, maybe. And I'm watching it because like, we like to go to the water park and I don't like to be in the water park water unless it's three digits because that water's cold and it's not worth it unless the air is hot. Right. Right. (laughs) But 
um, so I, I made some comment on Facebook and I had death threats after that because they're like, shh, don't bring it up. What are you doing? Yep. <laughs> the sun is going to yep. punish us. Yep. <laughs> so true. Anyway. Um, yeah, actually my aunt had a two-year-old and then twins and then 10 months later, another baby. Hmm. And Wow. You know, and I, we, we used to have not so nice, you know, ways of describing their kids and, um, and, you know, she, to me, she was my crazy aunt. And when I had one, I was like, I owe her an apology. Yes. <laughs> like, I get it now. So, I, I mean, I get a fraction of it. Yeah. I thought yeah. the same way when I became a mom, I was like, I need to just thank my mom just every day. <laughs> And I'm sure you will continue to have that thought <laughs> more, more often than you think you will. But yeah. so I love the term you said, intuitive eating. eating. Okay. So I think that, you know, women have, you know, super in strong intuition um, and it gets, sometimes it gets trained out of us to trust it. Sometimes we're, you know, we train ourselves out of trusting it, you know, whatever the case may be. But, um, I haven't ever thought of it until semi recently as eating being intuitional. So what I'm taking that to mean, and you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is that listening to your body about when you're actually hungry and what food feels good to you in your body. Yeah. That's basically what it is. It's very simple. Our body has cues that it gives us that say, Hey, you're hungry time to eat. Hey, you're full. That's enough. Like I've had enough. And it gives us cues around satisfaction. Like what is going to satisfy us? What isn't? And in my experience, it's all of the like diet culture noise that really keeps us like as women away from keeping it that simple. Like we want to overcomplicate it because of just how we've been brought up. And like you said, like certain things in our culture and upbringing just get us away from trusting ourselves. Um, get us away from this belief that we can trust our bodies with food. There's like this message constantly that you can't trust yourself. You need to count calories, weigh yourself every day, all of this, that is really breaking that trust that you have, that you can have with yourself. But, you know, when we really get back to just those, that simple, eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full and satisfied, eat you know, and, and stop the labeling with food, then we really can trust ourselves. And it really can be easy and simple. It's like the most simple solution. And I think a lot of people are afraid of it being that simple. They're like, no, I need a diet to follow. Like I need to have these rules and eat this, don't that, don't eat that. And it feels too simple to be true. But, um, you know, that's just, when we kind of look at how our bodies work and like I said, my background's nursing. So I have a little bit of that science anatomy background and it makes so much sense with how our bodies were built and designed that we don't need a diet. We don't need to, you know, follow a bunch of rules. We really have all that we need within ourselves and actually diets are known to work against our body's own intuition, which is why so many specifically Um, you know, what I see a lot of times is women come to me, they've been on all the diets, they've tried it all, they've kind of noticed this trend of it works for a little while until it doesn't until I like screw up one time, and then I fail and I fall off the wagon. And, you know, kind of, they get they're exhausted from that cycle. Um, So it's kind of like, all right, well, nothing's worked. So let me just try this. And um, it works because we're working in tune with how our bodies were designed to work and how to eat around food. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, there's factors that work against us in the 
standard American diet, <laughs> which I think is hilarious that that's, that's a sad diet, you know, um, that, but are when going out to eat are the pro proportions are when other people come to our country, they're like the food, they, they don't even know what doggy bags are in other countries. Like <laughs> it's crazy how much food that we're given. And personally, I would rather them charge me less and give me less because I don't need to take a doggy bag home, but I'm not going to eat all that they're giving me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, when we, you know, a lot of times when we're thinking about portion size too, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of us, at least I did, I don't know if this is your story too, but we came from a family that it kind of followed this clean plate club. So we are just so used to always having to eat all of what's in front of us instead of asking ourselves the question, am I full? Have I had enough? So like even in, you know, out in a restaurant in America where the servings are larger, you know, a lot of people have it in the back of their mind, like I have to finish everything versus if you go into that meal and you're like, really in tune with your body and what you, you know, what, how, how you're feeling, knowing that, um, you know, if I wanted, I could take it home if I want it again, or come to this restaurant again tomorrow, if I absolutely wanted this, like I could come back and get it again. Um, but we kind of have it in our minds that we need to eat everything and we don't pay attention to that inner cue of, no, I've had enough. And, you know, there's a lot of, other factors too that can go into, um, that go into eating. Like, um, what I have found is they, like I was mentioning eating healthy really is pretty simple and easy when we're just listening to our body cues. Um, but then there's all of the other, almost like I just it as external noise that's getting in the way. So, um, for one example, that clean plate club, like this thought or this belief or rule in your head that I need to finish everything on my plate, or um, this is a special food and I'm like on my cheat day. And so if I, you know, I, I have to eat all of it right now because this is like my one enjoyable meal and tomorrow I'll like go back to my diet, which is not very enjoyable, not very satisfying. You kind of like find yourself eating more of food than you really want just from that belief of, well, I, I got it. I have to enjoy everything right now because I'm going to go on my diet again tomorrow or like better tomorrow. Right. So there's a lot of things that get in the way of us listening to our intuition. So that's a lot of the work that I do with my clients is kind of unpacking all of these beliefs that are really keeping you from just eating intuitively. Um, yeah. When I first started paying attention to those kinds of stories, I want to say it was in 2018. I was taking a course through, through my life coach that was called weight loss for normal people, because when you're in the field of helping people in their weight loss journey or their health journey, you're you're a guru and you're like, you love it. Like you eat, breathe and sleep this stuff. And then there's normal people <laughs> who don't. And there's a gap between the, the normal people and the, the guru. And, and that was anyway, that was his premise, but he was taking the mindset approach of, you know, eating or weight loss basically and getting healthy. Um, and I remember like there's certain times that I've just walked into the kitchen and it's like, I'm not hungry before I walk into the kitchen, walk into the kitchen and there's something on the counter that's like, Ooh, let me eat that real quick just because it's there. Right. And, um, I think that my boyfriend was part of the clean your club, clean your plate club. I was to an extent, but it wasn't like you're not getting up from the table until you finish your food kind of a thing. Um, and so even last night he made, you know, some 
street corn or something. And he always adds extra stuff because every meal has to be the best meal ever <laughs> for him. Um, and he gave me, you know, a third of it because if he, he said, if I don't give it to you, I will eat all of it. Not because I'm hungry, but because it's there. And so he gave me part of it first to stop himself. And then afterwards, he's like, that was kind of a bittersweet thing because I'm really glad that I'm not feeling gross and bloated and, and exhaust and awful from eating too much but it was really good. And I really wish I had more of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I had another thought. Oh, one of my things was I was, uh, I didn't have a lot of money in my early twenties. I was, and I was struggling and want and wanting, not always knowing, you know, if I could afford the next meal I never mm. went hungry, but I was always afraid I couldn't afford it. Um, and so I got into a habit of never turn down free food. Yeah. And now I'm not in that position anymore, but when I was at Starbucks and somebody didn't pick up their buttery croissant, the Starbucks guy asked me if I wanted it. And I said, yes. And I don't like croissants. <laughs> and I had to ask like five people over over the next you know hour I was like do you want the croissant I don't because I just took it because they offered it because <laughs> I couldn't tell them no <laughs> yeah yeah it's like all of these things from growing up and just childhood and culture that just kind of layer on and and make it really hard to just literally like <laughs> so simple you know so yeah it, it definitely can be when we're paying attention to it, to our intuition, like you said, and, um, and listening to those thoughts, because a lot of us don't even know that we're having the thought of, oh, there's chips on the counter. I'm going to eat some chips and not being aware of like, I'm not actually hungry. I'm just eating them because they're on the counter. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so just opening up that that awareness is like step one, right? <laughs> yeah. Always. Awareness is always step one <laughs> yeah. and can already just like, you could already make some huge changes and shifts just from that awareness. And so the way I kind of describe it is like just being more okay. intentional. I think if we, if we just get a little more intentional and the way that I like to encourage people to do that is just start asking yourself questions and getting curious with yourself. Um, you know, we were talking about some of the things that keep us from trusting our intuition with food. And a big one that I see also is just a lot of self-criticism and judgment. And so this is actually why I, I do a lot of um, uh, coaching with my clients on self-worth, identity, um, you know, per, talking about perfectionism and things like that, because we, we tend to, for example, if you had the bag of chips on the counter and you ate them mindlessly and you overate and feel gross. And then a lot of times the next thing that you do when you notice, oh, I didn't want to do that. I feel disgusting now is the self-shaming. And then when we shame ourselves and we criticize ourselves and we beat ourselves up, a couple of things happen. Either we eat more <laughs> out of like rebelliousness. I, I say we all have a little inner rebel in us when it comes to food, little food rebel. So we eat more and that just exacerbates the problem or, you know, we, um, restrict for maybe our next meal or the next day. And when we restrict your body literally goes into the starvation mode which is another reason why diets don't work and they work against us when we restrict anything, even like mentally, we're like, we have these rules when our brain senses any kind of restriction, it's like our, um, the, we start thinking about food or our drive for food becomes even stronger because our body's like, 
we're potentially starving right now. We need to go find food. <laughs> so it makes it that much harder. And that's what sets people up for binging. So you kind of like stay on this cycle and you have that self-criticism. So that's why I always recommend like when you do overeat and you know, we're human beings, we're not perfect. So you likely will overeat. That is going to happen. But one of the worst things you can do is to go down that spiral of self-criticism. So instead what you can do is from just a place of neutrality, ask yourself, Hey, I'm I, interesting how I overate that. I wonder what happened. And usually you can find the answer. Usually you can look back and say, wow, I was just really stressed. And I was looking for that thing to like help with my stress or anxiety, or I'm really tired. I really need a nap, but I'm turning to food for that. Or, um, you know, a, a, or maybe like I'm super hungry. And I haven't eaten. And this is like the first thing that's in my, like in my space. So I'm just going to eat for unmindfully just because I'm, I'm starving. So usually, you know, when you do get curious, you can find out what led me to overeat and that can help you for the next time. So that's what I always encourage people to do is just get curious, ask questions. And, um, just from this place of, um, neutrality, not judging yourself. We can learn a lot, even just from ourselves when we approach it from that way. Yeah. Because your, your brain is like a computer. And when you put a question into the computer, it's going to spit out an answer. Mm -hmm. So if you ask it a disempowering question, like, why was I so stupid <laughs> that I overate, that I was eating mindlessly it's going to give you a disempowering answer because that's a very disempowering question. It's going to give you an answer. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a nice one. <laughs> it's going to be disempowering. But if you ask those curious questions without judgment as, as best as we can, because we're also judgment <laughs> machines, you know, okay. um, but if we ask the question from a curious place and just become a three-year-old child, why, you know, mm -hmm. to, kid, your, 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 your babies are about to start asking you why. <laughs> I know they are. They're not there yet, but it's, it's coming. <laughs> and, and when they do, they're not asking you why out of judgment, they literally just want to know the answer. And so if you, you know, revert back to your three-year-old self and say, so why did you eat the bag of chips? Well, because they were there. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's hide them, let, you know, or let's not buy them in the future or whatever the case is, you know, and you can make a more um, empowering decision when you ask <laughs> questions from an empowering place or from a curiosity place. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Did you I have say, I was going to say <laughs> another area that um, a lot of my clients that keeps them stuck. I was talking on just briefly brushed on the self image aspect, but is our body image, which I see such a connection with, um, you know, when we are, when we have a poor self image, we don't see ourselves. Well, we don't have a good relationship with our bodies. A lot of times that leads us to self-sabotage when it comes to food, because you know, maybe we don't see the results that we were looking for as fast as we wanted, or, you know, we step on the scale and one day it's down and then the next day it's up and it's, um, it becomes this, this part of us that gets really discouraged. Um, so a lot of what I do also is working on that body image, having a better relationship with ourselves. Um, because when we have a good relationship with ourselves, we're able to come at this part of us with working on our health from this place of self-care and kind of going along with what we just talked about with the, um, you know, curiosity versus judgment, we're able to kind of work alongside our bodies versus being at war with ourselves, which I think is a lot of times the approach that a lot of women are taking, especially, you know, women who are kind of like have tried a lot of diets. A lot of times there's a, this messaging, like your body's against you. Um, but my approach, I really believe that 
we have to get on the same team as our body. We have to befriend our body, learn, almost be like, I like to think of it like, I want to be a student with my body. We're working together to try to feel good. She wants to feel good too. So um, working on our self-image is really important too in this whole aspect that I don't see a lot of people talking about. Um, so that was another thing I just wanted to mention. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, our bodies are incredible. You've had, you've produced four ba- or two babies, you know, <laughs> um, I'm working on two at the moment. <laughs> They're in, and our bodies know what they need. And that's why we have cravings, you know, and it's like, when you think of your body as, as this life giving vessel, instead of this tub of lard or whatever other negative things that you're saying to yourself, you know, if think back to that three-year-old little girl and how would you talk to that three-year-old little girl about her body Mm -hmm. and like those kinds of, um, you know, imagining myself at three and four years old, I can get into tears real quick because I remember her, (laughs) she was a happy little girl. And when you're doing that self-criticism, that's who you're talking to. That's who's listening. And we would never speak to our children that way. But if you're not careful, you're speaking to yourself that way in front of your children. Yeah. And they're picking up on that. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm learning. They are little, my son just started talking a ton and it's like, we have to be careful, (laughs) you know, even just like little, like saying stupid. I'm like, I don't want him to say, (laughs) you know, but he's just picking up on everything. And yeah, they read um, a lot of women I work with and I can actually resonate with this myself too, is, um, you know, my, my mom never said negative things to me about my body. And a lot of my clients, it's, it's the same way, but I saw her speak neg- negatively about her body. And I saw my grandma speak neg- to herself about her body. And so I picked up on that and you know, started to be like, okay, well, this is just how we talk to our bodies and it's not helpful. And so, you know, I look at this work as like, this is breaking generational ties that, um, you know, have, you know, I, it's time to break, and, you know, doing this work on yourself. I, I get a lot of times the question, how do we encourage kids to have a good body image, to have a good relationship with food. And I really believe that the absolute best thing you can do, of course, you can talk to them about it and like be encouraging, lift them up about their bodies and with food. But one of the best things you can do is to do this work on yourself. And then they're going to pick that up. They're going to mirror it, which is so beautiful. Cause you know, you're the one that goes grocery shopping. Usually, you know, <laughs> you don't have to buy Right now, uh, I just introduced, this is my bad, but I had a pregnancy quick craving. I just introduced my son to uh, Gushers. Mm. <laughs> He'd never had Gushers before. What is and it? Gummies <laughs> in pregnancy? Because mine was sour gummies. And yeah. I'm still fat <laughs> kids. I love them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'm like, I was so nauseous for a month that it was just like, I, because I had ultimately, I'd really given up processed sugar um here and there I was eating it but it was it it was pretty much gone because I believe that or I heard somewhere that the cancer some cancers can't even can't survive without sugar and I'm like well then I'm just not going to give it sugar anymore (laughs) and then I was like I don't care what as long as if I can eat it and it stays down and I don't feel nauseous anymore I'm eating it and that's what's happening for the next, for the rest of this pregnancy. And then I'll go back <laughs> to what I was doing. But, um, you know, I introduced him to Gushers, but if I don't buy Gushers, he's, he, he's not going to buy them. You know, if I don't bring him into the house, he's not going to eat them, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, 
a lot of time I struggle with food with my son. That's one of my big struggles is just he's a picky eager eater. Although we just had a breakthrough with what it is that he's picky about. I understand a little bit more and it's more about texture than flavor. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, there were clues because he liked raw vegetables and not cooked vegetables. Um, but it came to a head when he, when I gave him mashed potatoes and he was acting like he, or he was probably actually gagging. (laughs) I interpreted it as he was acting like he was gagging. Um, and after that incident, he said, mom, I just don't like how it feels in my mouth. Cause I just couldn't understand. I'm like, you eat fries there. How are they different? I love all potatoes in any shape and form that they come in. So I just couldn't understand why you don't like mashed potatoes. Like that's the greatest thing that ever existed. And it was the texture. And so now I'm understanding that a little bit more and we're going to try and get him over that too. Cause there's no reason that that, is there a reason that that needs to be a thing <laughs> from a medical standpoint? Yeah, I don't think so, but I do think that a lot of people, a lot of kids have texture from what I've, you know, my experience, a lot of kids have texture issues with food. And I think, I think some of them grow out of it, but yeah. Yeah, I just don't want him to be a picky eater. Like he's going to camp next week and there's no choices in what food that he gets to eat. It's, this is the food that they made and you're going to eat it. And so my, you know, mom brain goes, well, he's just going to starve all week because he's not going to want to eat any of it. And my boyfriend was like, well, maybe he'll figure out, oh, this is a reason that I need to get over my picky eating this because I don't always have a choice in what food's being prepared. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe yeah. he'll always have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. <laughs> or he'll never want to go back to camp again because he doesn't like the food. But he actually went from um, we would, I would look at the calendar every, every week to see how many days he was taking school or taking, uh, food from home because he didn't like school lunch. And by the end of the year, I wasn't doing that anymore because he was liking all the school lunch. So it was, it was kind of a cool evolution, yeah. uh, like to see that happen. Mm. Yeah. yeah. All right. We digress. So, <laughs> Um, t- is there a piece of advice that you ha- want to share with moms? Hmm. Well, I think if this is, if you're kind of like resonating, I guess, with any of this that we've been talking about and, you know, you are feeling like, okay, maybe I do need to take a look at my relationship with food, my mindset, my relationship with myself and my body. Um, one of the biggest <laughs> first steps that I always recommend people to do if you want to get more in touch with your intuition is the way I describe it is um, you want to basically try to decrease the noise from all of the external influencers that are around you um, because then you're going to be able to hear more of that internal intuition. So I kind of use the example of like if you were at a concert and you were next to your best friend and she, you know, the music is like so loud, it's like a rock concert and she's trying to tell you something. Even though she's right next to you, you're not gonna hear her, right? You have to go outside, get away from the noise and then she could tell you and you would hear. So mm-hmm. the same thing goes with our bodies. You know, when we are influenced by so many external factors that are trying to tell you, eat this, don't eat that, eat this amount, measure this, only eat this number of calories. Um, that is, that is keeping you from paying attention to your internal cues. And so a couple of things right off the top of my head that, you know, you can do to start to decrease that, those factors is look at who you follow on, on social media. And I, I take a non-diet, uh, approach with my clients. So we really, Um, I don't focus on, um, weight loss. I focus on, you know, sometimes 
weight loss is one of the results that my clients get. But I really believe that just like some of those external factors that are the scale can keep you from paying attention to your internal cues. So, you know, for a lot of people, there's this connection, this relationship with the scale that's like, if I hop on the scale and it more than what I want, then I have a bad day or like I, my eating goes out, I stop caring. Right. Or if I step on the scale and it's less, then, oh, now I have a good day. And that's just giving the scale, giving an object too much power in my opinion. And it's just going to keep you from being able to pay attention to your internal cues in this initial period. So, um, paying attention to who you focus on social media and, um, kind of cleaning out and who doesn't, I guess, give advice that sounds, um, that's anyone who gives advice, that's basically super diety or keeping you from paying attention to your internal cues. Um, another thing is, um, you know, who you're subscribed to on email list. Um, I recommend, like I said just a moment ago, putting your scale away for a period of time, at least. Um, some people go as far as I'm just not going to weigh myself anymore. I know how it feels to feel healthy in my body. And I'm going to let that be my, my gauge. Um, but hiding your scale or getting rid of it, not weighing yourself for a period of time. Um, yeah. And then in that same kind of like analogy, how can you start to pay attention to that little inner voice when it comes to food? So like we talked about a minute ago, um, asking some questions, asking yourself questions, getting curious, paying attention to, okay, what does hunger feel like? Um, and hunger is such a scale too. So if you're noticing that you're getting super, super hungry before you're noticing like that you're actually hungry and you feel out of control eating because you're so starved, um, you know, maybe trying to pick up on a little bit of an earlier hunger cue that, you know, you can eat when you're just starting to feel hungry. Um, but paying attention to those little cues of hunger, what does fullness feel like? Um, and just getting, I think I've said that a million times, that's one of the greatest things that you can do to um, just start to listen to your intuition with food. And then one last thing um, on the topic of body image, um, just be aware of, you know, how are you talking to yourself? And is that... Is that lifting you up and encouraging you and it not? And one of the best things that you can do to start to change your body image is just changing the way that you speak to yourself. Um, so yeah, and of course, if you are wanting to do this work in a deeper capacity, this is how I work with all of my clients to help them get away from diet and really feel at home and calm with food, confident eating. So yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's also a couple of things that we haven't mentioned is the time of day eating, you know, it's breakfast. So I need to eat something. And I actually don't really get hungry until 10 o'clock and that's me, not everyone, but like, I actually don't get hungry until 10, but a lot of times we'll look at the clock and it'll say noon and we'll be like, Oh, it's lunchtime. I'm hungry. You know, that's, that's another, uh, you know, food trigger, hunger trigger. It's a trigger for I'm going to eat, eat something. There's another thing that happens. I think with some people, I it's happened with me. A friend of mine um, was this way too, where when you start losing weight, you don't have the identity of that person. That's, that's a thinner person. You've, lo you've lost the identity of that person. And so when I hit you know, 179 on the scale, I hadn't seen 179 in 15 years. And I stopped seeing 179 pretty quick. And I haven't seen it since, you know, and so it's even the losing of the weight. So that, those, that's another thought process that you, that you want to identify is, you know, it, what caused you to put the weight on in the first place? Because a lot of people put weight on as, as protection. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, it's, it's very beneficial 
to work with someone like Victoria because we can, you know, she can help you with those things that we don't understand on our own, that we don't know about on our own. She's worked with people that, that struggle with these types of issues. And so when you have someone in your corner, like we've been doing it on our own for, in my case, for 20 years or so, like, sometimes it's it you need somebody in your corner um because you don't want another 20 years to pass by and be in a situation where now it's 10 times harder because you're 20 years older or you have you know health problems because you've let it go on so long and i think for me one of the big shifts that i've had to make is i don't want to lose weight i want to be healthy yeah because my health is more important to me than what my body looks like. Mm -hmm. When you focus on health, your, the body follows what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to say one last thing I, I have found, and you know, I know this isn't necessarily the case for everyone, but I would guess probably most people listening know how to eat healthy. Like we know all the answers. And I think, you know, one thing that I see a lot of times is we keep looking for, okay, like what is that new diet going to like solve all my problems and, you know, tell me how I need to eat. But when we think about it, most people in my experience know how to eat healthy. That's not the actual problem. And diets actually just kind of work as a bandaid over top of what the real root issue is which is all about your mindset, your relationship with food, with your body, with yourself. Um, So that is really where the work is to be done. If you don't want to just go on diet after diet after diet again. Um, But yeah, most of of the people that I work with, the problem isn't that they don't know what to eat to be healthy. You know all the already, it's how do you actually implement it? in a way that is going to be sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's so much power between our ears that we don't even realize that like we, we have that information, why we're not doing it. It we you know, sometimes we need a coach to, to help figure that out. Yes. Yes. Big fan of working with a coach. Absolutely. Is <laughs> there, <laughs> what's that? As I know you are too. Oh yeah. Everyone needs a coach. That's my stance. Absolutely. Like you just, you get so much further along when, when you have a coach, that's just the simplest way to put it. Unbiased opinion. (laughs) Unbiased opinion. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, I'll go on a tangent for about coaches for a second, but like, it's not abnormal for an athlete to get a coach if you want to perf- your body to perform better inside the sport that you're you're playing and it's the same but this is with your life like your the way you experience the world like how why wouldn't you want someone to guide you in that yeah i agree i have a coach i love it it's my favorite thing i'm always working on like becoming more of who I want to be. Um, I think it's really important. So, so yeah. <laughs> missed my coach that whole month when I mostly slept, uh, <laughs> my strategy for nausea was to sleep through it. Um, Ooh, yeah. so, <laughs> anyway, um, is there a book that you have, that's been really helpful in your uh, personal development journey? Mm. I mean, I would say probably, probably I, I'm, I can't think of any other book except for as in like the most influential, except for the intuitive eating book, which is um, written by Elise Resch and Evelyn Triboli. Um, I got actually got my certification through them, but I actually, I didn't even talk about this, but I actually really struggled with my relationship with food. That's why I got into this work. I think it's why most, you know, coaches kind of get into their niche is they struggled. So 
I struggled with my relationship with food and an eating disorder and body image for a lot of my life. And uh, I had already done some of the work myself, but uh, to get out of that place, but um, reading that book and really just like something clicked in me. I was like, this is how our bodies are meant to, meant to eat. We were not meant to be on diets. They don't work. We're not meant to have to just stress about food all the time. And, and I kind of got to this point, I guess that this book revealed for me that I just didn't want to go through my life just feeling so obsessed with food. So, um, that was probably one of the most impactful because it, it shifted my career. It just changed everything about how I lived my life. Um, I was, you know, I, I had some hormone issues before, um, you know, from my struggles with food and now I have two babies. I was able to, you know, I was able to get pregnant. So, I would say out of every book, and I've read a lot of personal development that probably had the biggest impact on me. So I highly recommend it, especially if you, what's that? Oh, that it, I, I muted myself because my dog started barking at the gardener. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that sounds like, um, I, I feel like I've heard of the book before, but so usually when I hear of a, a book more than once, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I think I need to get that. It's the universe talking to me. Okay, great. So yeah, I yeah. highly recommend it. It's, um, it goes into so much more detail than anything that we talked about here. Um, I feel like we just scratched the surface. So if this piques your interest, you would love that book and it would be really helpful for you. So definitely check it out. I think I'll put that on my list. Um, well, thank you. So where can, where can the, our listeners find you? Yeah. So I am over on Instagram. My handle is at non diet underscore RN. And I just made a TikTok too. So I think I'm going to be venturing into the TikTok world, maybe. Um, so I, I might be on there. Um, and then I actually also have a podcast called the redefining health podcast. Um, and then obviously you can check out my website. It's Victoria Yates.com. And on that page, you can book a free consult with me. If you want to dive into this a little bit deeper, get a little more personal on what you're specifically struggling with. Um, and we can go from there. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for, uh, being a guest on, on imperfect mommy and for um, sharing your wisdom with uh, our listeners and um, and with me. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you so much. Such an honor to be here. Awesome. So uh, we will have another episode of imperfect mommy for you next week. And until then, keep healing. Bye guys. Thank you for tuning in to imperfect mommy. It's time for us to step up and realize that our power is not in trying to shape our children. Our power lies in shaping ourselves into the people we want our children to model themselves after. Don't just do it for your kids. Do it for yourself. When you become a more self-aware, compassionate, and confident person, you and everyone around you benefit. For more information about me and my work, visit alishalyons.com. That's A-L-Y-S-I-A. L-Y-O-N-S dot com. See you next time.